Day one of the NFL owners meetings is in the books, and it was all about Antonio Pierce. All that comes up on today's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast for Tuesday, March 26, 2024. Just win. Just win. Just win. Just win. You ought to win as a Raider. Pillaging just for fun. He'll knock you round and upside down and laugh when he's conquered and won. And won. And won. And won. And won. And welcome here, Raider Nation, to another edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Thank you so much for making the show your first listen of the day. Make sure you subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast to get the latest edition of the show as soon as it becomes available. As always, if you're checking us out on YouTube, we appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you in a major way. As a matter of fact, show continues to grow. That's because of you and my man, Ari, who does a great job making sure we're up on YouTube each and every day. On Twitter, at Ari Produces. You can hit me up as well, at your boy Q254. And we got the Lockdown Raider podcast voicemail line at 707 654 Four six nine three. No calls or texts coming up on today's show. It's all about Antonio Pierce. He met with the media very early on Monday, seven forty-five a.m. Eastern time, uh, at the owners' meetings in Orlando. Talked for a good thirty to thirty-five minutes. So you're going to hear all things AP. Everything he had to say to the media, you'll hear that today on the show. In segment number three, in segment number two, and even here in segment number one, talking all things quarterbacks, running backs, Josh Jacobs, Devontae Adams, the relationship with Tom Telesco, everything that you can imagine, all Raiders related, a lot of really good stuff from Antonio Pierce. You'll hear that on today's edition of the Locked On Raiders podcast. Sometimes it's just that simple, <laughs> right? If you have some good stuff like that, just go ahead and roll it out, and we're going to do that on today's show. We'll jump right into it after I tell you about the title sponsor, which is Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Antonio Pierce again, broken up in three parts: part one, two, and three. You'll hear it in segment number one, two, and three. So we'll start things off right now with Antonio Pierce speaking to the media, seven forty-five a.m. Eastern time on Monday morning. Starting off with Vic Tafer from the Athletic asking about free agent quarterback Gardner Minshew. A lot of quarterbacks available. Why was Gardner the right guy for you guys? He beat us. <laughs> Let's start there. Um, no, a competitor. Uh, we want that room to be competitive as possible. Um, AD did a hell of a job last year, uh, but like any, any other position in our, in our, on our team, uh, we want to make that as competitive as possible. Uh, you know, one thing about Gardner, as you've seen throughout his career, he finds a way, right? So um, that's going to make our room better. Um, he's been through a lot of adversity. You want that experience as well in there. So to me, it was a good fit, and it's a culture fit. Wild boy right there. I like the personality. From Detroit, I'm just curious, what, what are the Lions getting in, in, in a meek? Yeah, a ball hawk. I mean, a guy that's very, um, you know, you, you hate to say it, but he's kind of got like a little man's complex, man. He plays bigger than what he is. You know, you look at a 5'8", 5'9", guy, um, but, you know, extremely talented, gifted competitor. Um, sad to see him go, but you know, very proud of him. A special place in a coach's heart for a guy like that, 5'8", guy who, you know, from, from a small school who kind of just defeated the odds and plays as physical as he does? No, he does. I mean, he did an extremely good job for us, uh, always battled, was always the next man up, and then when he got the opportunity this year, he made the most of it. Since we've seen you at the Combine, you've done some pro days, you're doing a lot of head coaching stuff that you didn't have to do previously. How are you enjoying the role? I love it. I'm out at office. There's nothing wrong with being out at office, you know. Um, no, but it's good. You know, I'm a guy that likes to touch the players, be around the players. So a lot of good prospects in this year's draft. A lot of colleges that I would like to get to and, and make sure I have a good relationship with an organization so we get good information. And more importantly, um, you know, you're out there representing an organization and a brand. And I want to make sure people always see that Raiders shield everywhere we go. You mentioned uh, at the Combine that you're a go-getter. And if you have to be aggressive, potentially trade up, um, you'd be open to that. Do you, do you feel like that's within the realm of possibility? Um, I think everything's on the table. Whatever makes the Raiders better, I'm all for it. When I say I'm a go-getter, meaning whatever it takes to win, whatever it takes to get the best player to make our team the best, uh, that's what I want to do and that's what I like to see us do. Um, Tom Telesco you know, has a lot more experience in the drafts than myself. I'm going to lean on him and his expertise on what we should do. And if it's the right fit and that guy there that we want is the Raider and he fits the Raider culture in our way, then we'll go get him. Your evaluation, but there are some pretty good quarterbacks in this draft. Um, what's it been like now being a head coach to be able to assess that position? And what do you, what have you seen so far from these, uh, from this group? Yeah, it was good going at the combine, these pro days, getting around these uh, prospects. They're all ultra competitive. 
and that's what I like about them. You know, they all, you look at them, there's a few quarterbacks that got over 50 plus starts. There's some guys that, you know, three and done and one and done, you know, for that, for that matter. But what you're looking for is a leader. You know, you look at somebody that wants to come in, like I was asked earlier, you know, to come in that room and be competitive, give us that edge. And again, if it's a rookie, if it's Aiden, if it's Minshew, if it's Brown, you know, we're going to put the best player out there that gives us a chance to win. You obviously know Jaden from, from back in the day. Did you see when you were with him this type of a rise or potential out of him? Yeah, I thought he would be a Heisman winner. I did. That was my recruiting pitch to him. I just thought it would be where I was at previously. Do you think his game could translate to the NFL? If you win a Heisman, most likely you, you guess. You know, um, when you look at you look at Jaden and all these quarterbacks, you know, extremely talented. One thing about him that I think separates the rest is his ability to run. He can run, run. You know, when you can run like that in the SEC and put up those kind of numbers, uh, I think that translates very well. You think he can bulk up for the pros, or does he need to? Um, I think he's just let you know nature take its course. You know, I mean, obviously he's been doing it as a slim athlete throughout his whole career. So I think just with, you know, being the nature of a man, you'll get bigger as you go along. So he'll be fine. You were saying the best quarterback for you is who will play. How do you, as a de developing a rookie quarterback is always a challenge. How do you see that helping a guy to evolve into a league? Is rushing him, is playing him quickly, rushing him? Is you need to get the mistakes out of the way? How do you kind of view that? Yeah, I think it all depends on the quarterback we get and, and who that guy is. I mean. Do you want to throw him to the fire? No. Uh, you, I don't think that's been the best way. I played with a guy like Eli Manning. First pick overall, didn't play until like week eight or nine, his rookie season. Didn't become a starter until year two. So a thousand ways to skin a cat. Uh, we'll do what's best for the player and ourselves going forward. And we'll just really just let it play out. I can't really answer that question now. Antonio, yeah. what did you uh, what you think of uh, Jordan Love? You caught him early, yeah. early in the season when they, they were struggling when they played you guys. Yeah, I'm glad we played him early when he was struggling because at the end of the season, he was a uh, he was a problem. You know, he's, he's mobile, he's athletic, does a hell of a job with accuracy throwing, you know, off platform. And you can see at the end of the season the confidence that he played with. He was extremely good, and obviously, as he played well, the team played just as well with him, along with that running game. So it's another thing, just like the question I was just asked. You know, here's a guy that sat on the bench for several years, got a chance to learn behind a Hall of Famer. And then he goes out there and he performs the way he did to get his team to the playoffs. Why do you think teams aren't able to do that? Packers did it with Rodgers and him. Kansas City sat at Mahomes for a year. Yeah, some are fortunate. I mean, if you look at the guy in front of him, most of the teams we're talking about, we're talking about Alex Smith, number one pick, Aaron Rodgers, again, future Hall of Famer. So certain teams have that luxury of sitting a young quarterback. You guys have combine getting a stud defensive tackle. You guys went out and pretty much got the best guy on, on, on the market. How does he change the defense? How does he change the defensive line? Makes life easier for us as coaches. I tell you that when you get good players, makes life easy. But um, what it does, along with the other gentlemen that we brought back, John Jenkins and Adam Butler, I mean a lot of depth to that D line room. You know, we want to be strong there. That, that's going to be our strong point of our team. As you can see, I think from one to ten, feel really good with those guys. You know, but Christian, the energy man, personality, the love for the game, and now we got somebody on the front with Max Crosby, full blown effort. You know, I mean, for 60 minutes, and that's what we're looking for. And I think uh, for us to get a player of his caliber, the way he's played over the last, really, his entire career, is going to be a blessing for Raider Nation. You played linebacker, and you played behind some really premier defensive linemen. How does that change that level of the defense, having those type of guys? Yeah, it makes life easy for me because they're worried about blocking those four guys and not me, allow me able to run. And that's what's going to happen for Robert Splain as well. You know, you're going to have to deal with Max Crosby, Malcolm Kuntz, you know what I mean? Um, obviously Christian. So now you look at Diablo and Robert Spillane, should free those guys up even more to make more plays and be more productive on the other side of the field. I know you wanted Josh Jacobs back. What was sort of your reaction to how that played out in the Yeah, you know, don't like to see it. You know, you know, I made it known, you know, heartbeat, a Raider through and through, but as we all know, it's a business. And you hear that line, but it's true. Money talks, BS walks, right? And um, he had to do what's best for him and his family, and I wish him the best, but uh, that one hurt. As a head coach, you know, obviously you get more into the salary cap and roster management, what you can and can't do. Is that kind of like a, a learning lesson almost of like? Yeah, no, I mean, that, I was going through that process, you know, as I was interim uh, head coach throughout the season, but it was expected. You know, there's certain things that you just like, all right, this can happen. Uh, you wish it doesn't, but again, it's the nature of the beast. Every team deals with it. Um, you got to move on and move forward. The good thing about it, you know, Zamir got a, a great opportunity last year. We've seen what he's able to do, and now, you know, he's going to be a front runner along with, you know, Alex Madison.
AP, talking to people about your transition to being a head coach, you have surprised some people with your ability and willingness to listen. Most guys, their first chance as a head coach, are, that's an area there they struggle. What is that about you that prepared you and made you such a good listener to the people around you? Yeah, it really starts with the guys that you know coached me when I was younger. And that was one of the main things he used to always talk about. Just need to listen, guys. You need to listen. When you're a young bull, you know, in your 20s, you think you know it all. As you get older, you make enough mistakes. And for me, to be in this position, um, and then obviously you can see who I surrounded myself with, um, I'll be a fool not to listen. You know, Joe Philbin, Marvin Lewis, Tom Coughlin, you know, on speed dial, are in the building with me every day. But not even that. Patrick Graham, you know, he's been a coordinator, been very successful. And just listen to all our guys. I think it's been a blessing for me to listen because at the end of the day, I'm not rushing to make a decision. I'm taking all, I'm gathering all the information and hopefully I'm making the best decision for our organization. Are you wired that way um, when you, let's just say you need some depth on the offensive line or a starter on the offensive line? Are you one of the, we got to get that done like right now or, or can you see the bigger picture in this process? Yeah, I think initially I'm always going to be like, I want to get it done now. Again, I've always said when you're in this position, I'm racing time. Right, and that doesn't stop now. Um, you want to win now. You want to put the best team together now. But you also understand it's a process. You know, it's a process, and um, it's a great question about the offensive line because that's something that you know we still need to fill there at that position. And um, there's a thousand ways to do it, right? It's not always through free agency. There's a draft, and then there's other ways as, as other ones. Tom is very disciplined. What how he approaches contracts, and as we get closer to the draft, free agent prices go down. Are you? Is it? Interesting for you sitting in that chair, watching how the free agent market kind of plays out? It is. Because the guard market blew my mind. I said, wow, that's, I need to play all line now. I need to switch positions. The boy's getting paid. But um, no, patience is a value. It's something that you, know, you learn as a new head coach. Um, you're not going to get everything right away. Sometimes the most expensive player, prospect, our position might not be the one that fits you the best. And I think the one thing about Telesco, he is patient in that sense. You know, he's, he's very thought out. Again, he's done it for a long time. He's been successful with building rosters. And that's, I think that's the reason why we, we mesh well, because you do, you got a young bull like AP that I want to go out there, I want to go get it now. And he's saying, easy, there's another way to do it. And we don't have to do it at such an expensive cost. So that was just part one of the conversation. Again, there's three parts. Uh, it's about 35 minutes long uh, all together. And uh, you're going to hear it all here on the show. So coming up in segment number two, again, Vic Tafer will lead us off. We'll talk things Andre James and the offensive line. That'll come up in segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. We'll jump right into that after I tell you about the title sponsor of the show, which is Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry about buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to all sports, music, comedy shows, theater events, everything near you. They've got you covered. They got great last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their best price guarantee. Game Time will literally take the guesswork out of buying tickets. And they got the great last minute tickets. They got the flash deal, the zone deals, easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. And also, even shows that have already started or events that have already started, even an hour after it starts, it's a place to find all those last minute seats. Right now, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create that account, use the redeem code Locked On, all one word, L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number two of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. Again, it's all things Antonio Pierce, all things NFL owners meetings. Anytime you get an opportunity to hear from AP, you want to hear from AP. I was talking about him on my radio show on Monday, Raider Nation Radio 920, Unnecessary Roughness, and just talking about what he really means to this organization, what he means to the fan base, and the fact that he's really helped provide that identity of the Raiders and, and gave Raider Nation a lot of hope. So anytime that AP talks, it's must-listen material. So here we go, part two of the conversation with AP from the owners' meetings on Monday. Vic Tafer again from The Athletic, starting things off, talking all things Andre James. I got the job. You mentioned you were in the O-line room a lot that first week. What did you see in Andre James that week, and why did you want him back the next next? Hard worker, warrior. Got that grit to him. Got that mentality that you want in the O-line room. And he was kind of the glue to us up front. You know, Colton Miller was there as well, but you remember, he missed time. Andre missed time, but, but both of those guys, Colton Miller and Andre, did a hell of a job 
in the meeting rooms, on the practice field, keeping us kind of dialed in on focus on what we want to do and really setting the tone. And in our offense, you know, the center is very important as far as communication. So Telesco said it. I've said that you want to keep all your guys as possible and re-signing those guys like a Josh Jacobs or Andrew James. We lost one, but we gained a really good player that, you know, is going to be a Raider priority for a long time. Describe not only the relationship between you and Telesco, but also with Mark Davis kind of overseeing the whole thing too with the three headed monster, so to speak. Yeah, the Mark Davis thing is cool, man. Like, we got a really good relationship. It's, you got to be around it to see it and understand it. Um, Telesco as well. Um, me getting to know him, understanding his process, his why. But then I think when you put us all together, I mean, because you know how Mark is, you kind of know how AP is, and then you got Telesco. It's a hell of a mix. I tell you what, different personalities, but there's one to go and one vision in mind, and that's to put the best product on the field um, and represent the Raiders the right way. And, and I think Telesco, through his background, understands how that process is, and he's understanding more and more what it's like to be a Raider, especially with AP. Do you imagine yourself sitting at this table a year ago? No, no, no. Eventually, though, eventually. But no, I, I no. But at the end of the day, when you have dreams and you have a vision and you have plans for your future and what you see yourself doing, you know, I've watched enough, you know, television networks to see like, all right, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in that seat one day. Just like I thought I'd be a professional player and thought I'd win a Super Bowl one day. There's no different in the position I'm in now. Uh, I see myself in this position and hopefully one day sitting at that damn podium with the Lombardi trophy next to me too. That's my goal. Until, I, until that happens, I'm not going to stop. A wide degree of uh, disagreement on this hip, the, the hip drop tackle. Um, that role is going to be coming up, it sounds like, uh, the, the, today, I think. What's your view on, on, on that technique? Yeah, well, I don't want I don't think it's a technique. I'm a former player. I think that you try to get a guy down. You know, I think there's a thousand ways to get the tackle. I don't think there's one right way. Certain players, you know, they don't have the physical strength to take down a 240-pound man or 220-pound running back. So. Um, I don't think it's being taught, to be honest. I think it's just something that's, when you look at the way the game is played, it's such a horizontal game, the angles. You know, we talked about it yesterday in that meeting. It's four, I think it said 40,000 plays on the season, and that play showed up around 250 times. So you're not talking about something that happens as often as we're talking about. But the disappointing part about it when it does happen, an injury, you know, right? You're talking about high ankle sprains, fractures, MCLs, ACLs, the knees. So, you know, anything that you can do to protect the player and player safety, safety of all four, but I don't think it's being taught. I'll stay away from that. Past hiring cycle, um, we saw a few guys like yourself, Gerard Mayo, Raheem Morris, defensive-minded black guys who get head coaching jobs, and that's not something that typically happens that often. Um, is that something that kind of is encouraging that you think for the future of kind of trying to not just maintain but increase the number of black head coaches in the league? Yeah, no, I think it's encouraging. Um, the defensive-minded part, I mean, when you talk about myself, Mayo, D'Amico Ryan, you're talking about guys that were the captains, that were the leaders. I know we all talk about the quarterback. What the hell did you think I did when I played? I ran the show. Those guys ran the show. So they know how, what it's like to be a leader. They know what it's like to be in front of a team, in front of a huddle, speak to guys, get them to do what they want to do. Um, I think it's encouraging to see the minority um, aspect of the coaches, you know, now coming to the forefront. But then they like all of us, black, white, Asian, no matter what color you are, you got to win. It's production based. You know, you get this opportunity, you got to make the most out of it, especially as a former player. To me, that's the most important part. Seeing a guy like myself and other players now want to get into coaching. Now, yeah, look at AP, he did it. Maybe I have that opportunity. I look, I take more pride in that than anything else because a lot of my former players struggle financially and finding jobs and finding their way after they get done playing. So here's a great opportunity to look at myself and hopefully the other gentlemen to be role models for them. What's Aiden have to do? You talked about him earning the right to be part of the competition at least. What, what does he have to do year two in your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think what you saw is what, at the end of the season, you know, taking care of the football, managing the game, putting points on the board. I would love to see him become more vocal, right? Is he ever going to become a runner? No, not going to happen. That's okay. But there's other ways that you can do that and move around in the pocket. I think he's done a great job this all season be in the building, staying in the Las Vegas area and really working on that. So one thing I love to see him do is be more vocal. You know, you don't want the quarterback being a, a church mouse. And I don't need him being a rah-rah guy either, but you know, when things is wrong, I need him to fix it and be vocal about it. What kind of quarterback did you absolutely hate facing? Damn runner, Michael Vick. That, that was the Vick, McNabb, all those guys, because it's 11 on 11. I like the Tom Brady's, the Peyton Man of the world, sit there. You throw that, that marker down, he's still there. But when that marker started moving and now I'm in coverage, 
Do I come out? You know, do I stay with my guy in zone coverage? You know, do I turn my back, go plaster as we call it, find the nearest receiver? Those guys are always difficult, man. The guys that move around, Patrick Mahomes, just a thorn, right? Because he extends the play now, goes from 2.2 seconds to 2.6, 2.7, sometimes three and four. That, that's, that's never good for a defense. AP, hey, your career, you've, had, you've never had anything given to you, whether it's coming out of high school, coming out of college, all of it, you've had to earn everything. Is that maybe in, in dear players like that to you, guys that you think, Oh, I can see some of me, nothing given into them, they're a dog. Do you, is that, do you notice that a different approach as a head coach looking for those guys like you? Yeah, I don't want anybody that's entitled. They don't have a little chip on their shoulder. We're not going to mesh. It's just not going to happen. So that's why it's good when you ask me about the pro days and why I'm out and about because you don't see that. You can't always see that on film. We got to be around each other. I got to hear you talk. I got to look in your eyes. That's the culture we're setting. You know, when you look at a Max Crosby, Robert Spillane, Jacoby Myers, those, are, those guys all play with a chip on their shoulders. Andrew James, Andrew James, they understand what it's like to be the underdog, and that's fine. And, and once we're on top, we'll know what it's like to be the top dog. But you want those guys that got a little bit more ish to them when we go out there on Sundays. What will it be like um, not having to deal with Aaron Donald in terms of game planning for the Rams at this point? Well, first off, it's sad to see him go because you're talking about probably one of the best defensive tackles of all time. Um, but the good part is he's gone. You don't have to go out there wearing 99 night, you know what I mean, and look for him. That really helps. That really helps an offense. Like we're talking about Aiden. Aiden is a lot more comfortable right now, right? So um, it, it's one of those things, like I think with all great players, you, you hate to see him go, but you respect what he's done for the game, the way he set the standard. You're talking about a smaller D tackle who dominated the National Football League for 10 consecutive years. Very impressive. You said you're willing to be aggressive and to try to go up and get a quarterback if they're there, but you know, realistically, looking at the top three teams, like it's possible all those teams could take quarterbacks. Um, there are some other guys that could be available later. What do you think about kind of that next group of guys, like a JJ McCarthy, Michael Penix, Bo Nix type of? Prospect? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even put them in the next group of guys because there's some people that probably see them as number two or three. I mean, we don't know everybody's board. I think it's a very talented group. I mean, we we interviewed most of those guys at the combine. Had great conversations with him. J.J. McCarthy, you're talking about a national champion, a winner. So I don't know how he's not in the top three, if you want to be honest. And then you look at Bo Nix. I mean, what is it, 61 career starts? Like, come on, man. Like, that's crazy. Played against Justin Herbert. Yeah. So if you grab a kid like that, well, he's done that already. That's kind of cool. Um, but there, there's a very talented group, even Penix, you know, taking his guys to the national championship with the University of Washington. So... To be honest, yeah, do you, you want a certain quarterback. You got your eye on one or two and three, but I don't think you go wrong in this year's draft with any of these guys. Now, do they pan out? I don't know. You know, it's the fit. It's when they get brought along. It's the system. A lot of things go into play. Kind of a premier quarterback to that room, along with Nate and, um, and, and Jack. Saw you talking to Terry and Arnold. Um, there seems to be some pretty good cornerbacks in this draft. What's your assessment so far of that group? Yeah, I like Arnold, man. We had some good conversations. It started the combine because he kind of came in a little lackadaisical. And, you know, I was like, hey, man, where's the juice? I heard you, you know, you had a little stuff to you. And that picked up and then went to pro day. I was just, you know, we were just talking about ball and trying to get to know him a little bit more as a person because you never know, like, what things are happening in the draft. Um, but whenever you can be around a good football player, you want to, you know, you want to talk to him. And I think it's good for a person like myself, former player, to tell him what they expect. If he goes first round, goes second round, he goes back to the bottom of the lineup, right? He's got to start from scratch and earn his stripes. So when you look at this draft, you do see a bunch of talented DBs who I think can come in and play right away. You see that with the offensive line as well? Yeah, I think there's, man, there's some big boys now. That, that tackle group, oh, my God. Like, you're talking about a bunch of trees walking around at the combine at these pro days. It's, it's impressive. Like, you know, you look at those three positions, quarterback, O-line, and the DBs. It's a very talented, deep group. Obviously, you, Coughlin was your coach, but he's from the Parcells tree. And Parcells talked about when picking quarterbacks in a draft, he wanted guys with a ton of experience, didn't want the guys with a little. Do you share that sentiment, or have you a little bit different? What, what's your thought process? No, for me, you want a guy that's experienced, that's won. I want a winner. No, more important, I want a guy that's won. Has a little grit to him, dealt with adversity. Um, the experience part, it helps you. You know, when you get a quarterback, I would say, let's say 19, 20 years old, if he happens to come out that early, 
those two years from a gentleman that's 22, 23 is a big difference from a maturity standpoint and what they've seen in the game. In regards to what you've seen in college, the pros is a whole different animal. So having a player that's played, let's say, you know, 24, 36 games and been a starter and a winner, that, that fits right up our alley. You mentioned uh, Madison. You also added Harrison Bryant. What's the Pierce uh, scouting report on those two guys? When you look at these guys, man, I mean, you're talking about the Raiders that fit our culture. The guys that, you know, we're talking about depth. We're talking about guys that could come in and, and at some point don't know when it's going to happen, but give us that, that start or that little jolt or juice that we can use. I think for us, man, in free agency, we're just looking for guys that have had the best fit for us as a team, that fit in that locker room, and again, to keep building that culture that we want to be, and hopefully they're winners. To get Jane what? You got, what? You got the pick? Can you go make that happen, please? Just okay, how are you doing? Good, how you doing? When you look at your team, how important is it for you as a head coach to protect your culture? I mean, you've got, you got a really unique culture and a good one. So how important is it for you, or do you see yourself as the bodyguard of that culture of your locker room? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm the guardian at the gate. Not letting any evil come through that building. Not happening. Because um, that's important, man. Like, what we're able to do at the end of the season, what we're doing right now, I know you guys are not in the building. It looks different. It looks different. I can tell you that. Um, the players are protective of it. You know, they want to know what coach you're bringing in. If you're bringing in somebody from ops or media or wherever, like we're checking badges, we're checking resumes, we're checking how you are. That's important to us. Um, I said it probably several times now. Being a Raider is different. Being a Raider as me as a head coach is going to be really different. Um, and we want that fit to be perfect. Is there going to be some ups and downs, yeah? Are we going to have some disagreements, yeah? But we can't sit at this table and talk it out, and that's the problem. And I made a you know, poor judgment when I brought him in the building. So there's part two of the conversation with Antonio Pierce from the owners' meetings in Orlando. Again, a couple-day event. It will get all wrapped up later on this afternoon, and then uh, everyone will officially leave Orlando on Wednesday. But when AP talks, like I mentioned before to start this segment, we all listen. Coming up in segment number three, Josina Anderson from CBS Sports will actually start things off talking about the relationship between AP and Tom Telesco. That's coming up in segment number three of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. And we'll get to that after I tell you about FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. And I don't know about you, but the dancing has been a lot of fun from the men's tournament to the women's tournament, punching tickets to sweet 16. has been great. You're starting to learn about a lot of teams, uh, Oakland that is not from Oakland, California, but Oakland, Michigan. You learned about grand Canyon. Uh, you saw the blue bloods come through like the first of the month. And of course the women's game has been fantastic as well. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets. If your first $5 bet wins, that's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win the whole thing. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Here we go, Raider Nation. Segment number three of today's Locked On Raiders podcast. No calls or texts, but part three of the conversation. Antonio Pierce with members of the media there in Orlando at the owners' meetings. Talked to guys like Vic Tafer, Tashawn Reed, Paul Gutierrez, Vinny Bonsignor was there, obviously. Uh, Hondo Carpenter was there. Uh, Josina Anderson from CBS Sports and many others. Tom Pel Pelissero from NFL Network. Uh, of course, Mike Garofalo and a whole lot more were all in attendance. Steve Weish uh, talked to AP. Uh, just again, it's one of those opportunities as I was there last Last year in Phoenix, uh, get an opportunity to have about 30 or 35 minutes with the head coach and just, uh, you know, pepper him with all kind of questions. So here it is, Josina Anderson starting things off, talking about the relationship between AP and Tom Telesco. How would you describe how your kind of rapport is building with uh, Tom Telesco as far as just meshing um, theories, philosophies as far as building the team and is some of the aggressiveness that we saw you know, right at the outset of the um, legal tampering period with the people that you got to, um, you know, add to your team, will we kind of see that aggressiveness, so to speak, in a good way in terms of really going after who you want typified in what you do day one of the draft? Yeah, I think, you know, like um, I probably mentioned earlier, me and Telesco, I think it's a process. You know, we're only probably, what, two months into this bad boy together, learn each other's mannerisms, talk, there are reasons why. His reasons why, his philosophy, his big picture, my big picture, probably to mesh, meshing that together. But being important, just doing the right thing and not rushing to a decision. Being aggressive, I mean, I'm always going to be aggressive. I want to win. That, that's just in my nature. It's good having a gentleman like Tom Telesco to calm me down. Um, 
But at the end of the day, I know it's a production-based business, and I'm not trying to wait two or three years to win. So he balances you? He's my balance. It's yin and yang. <laughs> Um, you know, you reference with the guys that are in your building all the time that, that they would notice the differences on, on what it is. I'm not there all the time. So can you explain, like, what are some things that you're already seeing different in your building since since things, since this offseason's really begun? Yeah, I mean, we got 30 guys in offseason. We've been averaging about 20 guys since after the Super Bowl in our building working out every day. And I'm not talking about the rookies. Max Crosby, Devontae Adams, Colton Miller, some of our key players, Aiden O'Connell. Um, it's loud. It's kind of like this right here. It's a lot of chatter. It's noisy. People not walking on eggshells. You being yourself. You're smiling. You come to work happy. You know what I mean? So it's um, it's two different type of people in life, right? There's people that work to live and people that live to work. So what is this telling you about what you think is is happening in your building? Then, like, what, when you're hearing all this and, and and you're describing this, why why does this make you happy? That's how football should be. It's a kid's game. You get paid a lot of money, a lot of pressure. Shouldn't come to work mad. You know, should be enjoying every day, every second of it. It's a part-time job. I was 21 when I came to the league. I was 31 when I left. It was a part-time job. I had to go get several other jobs to where I'm at today to be in this position now. So don't take it for granted. Love what you do. Um, be proud that you're with the Raiders organization and that hopefully you're around something that we're building that's going to be special. This is your first uh, your pre-draft process as a head coach. What are you enjoying about it the most? What do you like about this process this month so far? People, man, going out there touching those players. I like the pro days. I wish I had done it even sooner. Should have left them March 1st. Had me a little mini vacation. Let me go out there and hang out with the guys. But, no, nah, man, I, I love meeting the coaches. I love meeting the new prospects, hearing the different ideas. We get this big old book, right, like a yellow book, the old school yellow pages. It's got all this information in there. Not saying it's right or wrong, but it's different when me and you talk one-on-one. -on -one. It's different when I feel and touch you and look in your eye. Totally different sense of how I view the player. And at the end of the day, as you ask me about the culture and the fit, I got to look you in the eyes and say I'm comfortable with dealing with you 16 hours a day. Not 16 minutes. 16 damn hours for 365 for the year. So, and that's big for me, right? Because if you don't like who you're around and like who you're working with, it's not going to work out. How much do you think your presence <coughs> with the team uh, has to do with just kind of, you know, Devontae Adams' overall perspective about being, you know, with the team? And if you had not been there, what, how might that have been different? Yeah, so we never talked about the not being there part. We left that out. Um, we always talk positive and everything's moving forward. Um, but so we, everything's not always positive. No, you, you know, it's always a positive sign. You can spin okay. it that way. We spin it that way. Okay. We were positive reinforcement in our building. Mm -hmm. uh, but having a guy like Devontae want to be a Raider, I don't think that's ever changed. I think when you saw him shake his dreads after the first game, you knew what time it was. That was going to continue. We plan on that continue. We're talking about one of the best receivers in the game. To have him in our building for our corners, for Jack Jones, for Nate to go against that every day, makes us a better defense on Sunday versus our opponent. And then to have the leadership of Devonta, his presence, you guys notice, when he talks, there's substance there. So keeping Devonta at peace, <laughs> Makes everybody's life a lot easier, especially mine. And what's the best way to keep him at peace? Throwing the ball. <laughs> Coach, talk to me about some of the other leaders you have in the locker room that are going to help build this franchise. Yeah, Robert Spillane. I think we don't talk about him enough. Bell cow. Broke his hand, was in the hospital, called me, half drugged up. AP, I'm on the plane. I'm like, man, no, you, better, you better stay in that hospital bed. Sure, the next day, cast up, playing the game. Didn't miss a snap. Every practice, dependable. Then you talk about Max Crosby, by example. 6 a.m., 5 p.m., every day. Every day. Shows up ready to work. So when you got those kind of guys in your building, either vocally or, you know, by example, uh, you got a good culture and a good place. So what about your work ethic that you're instilling into these new young players that are coming into the league? Yeah, we chop wood every day. I put my horse blinders on. I listen to all the, the naysayers that tell me that they know AP better than AP knows himself. Um, and at the end of the day, I, you know, roll up my sleeves and, and just grind it out, man. Like, I'm not a finished product. I'm getting better each and every day as I'm doing this. I'll be better a year from now than I am today. And that's, that's my goal, just to keep chipping away. And I'm not going to stop until I get what I want. And everybody know what that is. And my last question, as a black head coach in this league right now, talk to me how you personally feel about, you know, breaking the ceiling, the barrier, all of that. Man, I love it. I talked about it earlier, though. More than just being a black athlete or a black man, being a former player in this position. Not doing it to the norm, 
I don't look like all the other coaches. I don't talk like the other coaches. Ain't nothing wrong with that. There ain't no damn rule book or no, no process that you got to be like X, Y, and Z. I can be AP and do it my way and do it the right way. And that's how we're going to do it. Jack Jones and Nate Hobbs are probably in that category as well, especially Jack. What are the ceilings for those two guys? Hi. Again, I've known Jack since he was 13, man, and it just he just keeps keeps rising. And there's still more there, you know. Gaining some weight, first and foremost, get the little sucker in the, in the weight room, get him bigger. Um, but what he brought to our team when he got here was the swag, the confidence, that go-getter mentality, the go-make plays, anticipating film study. You mix that with a Nate Hobbs, who was a physical freak. And you got, you got a pretty good duo there. And all they do is now battle. Like, just the competition. Again, I talked about it with the quarterback position. If it can start there and it now filters through every room in our building, especially DB room, you got to love it. Those guys got to have thick skin. He's going to get beat. He's going to miss a tackle. It's okay. Next play. And they both have that mental toughness to play the position. Yeah, Pete, when you talk to people about Jack, they talked about him getting cut, how it hurt. Yeah. But that when he got to the Raiders, the guys just – grabbed him like he'd been there forever. What do you think it meant to him as a young man that the team bought into him before he had even sold them anything? I mean, before I brought Jack in, I went to some of our leaders on defense and explained to him who Jack Jones is and what we need to do. And I said, first thing to do, we got to put our armors around him, love him up, but also hold him accountable, that when he screws up, we're going to check him. And um, we did just that. And Jack has known me for a long time that if he screws up, he knows he's going to get a whole different raft of AP. But it's good to see our leaders like, like Max, Marcus Epps, right away go to him and grab him when there's something going on either in the locker room or on the field. Hey, man, young buck, calm down. We're going to be good. That's what you don't see enough of in this league. That peer pressure is bigger than anything else you can do. I can do it all day as a coach, but when those 11 men on the field do it together, that's a different animal say of his character that he took it from his teammates? I think that says a lot about him too, doesn't it? A lot of maturity. A lot of maturity. Like I said, Jack's come a long way. He hasn't always made the, you know, the right decisions and the best decisions. But the maturity that you see, he's a young man, he's a father now. He has more responsibility than just worrying about Jack Jones now. And to see him take accountability for some of his actions is huge. Oh, I'm, I'm curious on your thoughts about the hip drop, especially as a former player and knowing yeah. how how it works in real time. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on it? Can they officiate this rule? Uh, I mean, you can officiate anything now. Is it going to be tough to do? I do think so. Um, I, I think it's one of those deals as a player, there's so many different opportunities in the game to make a face-up tackle, no problem. But there's a lot of times, man, you just got to figure out how to get that guy down, right? And sometimes, you know, you drop on the back of a guy's legs. And that's not what you want to do because you know there's a possibility that somebody get injured. So when we're talking about player safety, and you're talking about the rule and the possibility of, you know, having this rule be, you know, to go through and propose, it's all for the player's safety. And, and if you're talking about that, I'm all for it. I don't think it's being taught. I think there's certain guys that just don't have the physical traits to take down the 220, 240 pound man. So you get caught in awkward positions to put them down. So there it is right there. I know it wasn't a whole lot of me. It was AP doing the heavy lifting on today's show, but sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes you just get out of the way and let, you know, the real subject do all the talking. And whenever AP is talking, I believe Raider Nation wants to hear from him. Uh, he tells you a whole lot without telling you too much, if you know what I mean. But, you know, it lets it be known what he's thinking, how he's feeling. You know, obviously uh, shows a lot of love to Aiden O'Connell, uh, talking about the culture of the Raiders organization, uh, who's going through that door, why they're bringing in certain guys. And, you know, we'll obviously have plenty of time to talk about everything that he said and really break it down. But I thought it was great for you to be able to hear the whole thing, kind of uh, digest it, uh, think about it, maybe even listen to it again and hear exactly what AP had to say about a lot of things from free agency to the draft and a whole lot more coming up tomorrow. You know, actually talked about it coming up on today's show and never got around to doing it because of the AP sound, but we did a deep dive on Jordan Travis uh, on my radio show, Raider Nation on Unnecessary Roughness on Raider Nation Radio 920 on Friday. Also did a really good deep dive on J.J. McCarthy on Monday. I'll probably have a couple sound bites from both of those on tomorrow's show. Then again, who knows what the, the rest of the owners' meetings will, will have to show today. So maybe that'll take front stage and, and, and be the big headline and the storyline that we talk about. 
Not too sure, but uh, we'll have plenty for the show. Please believe that. We'll get back to calls and texts as well. Straight off that Locked On Raider podcast voicemail line, news and notes, and a whole lot more. You know how we get down around here, Raider Nation. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing from Antonio Pierce. Until tomorrow, Raider Nation, take care of yourself, take care of your family, love on your family. Most importantly, as always, just win, baby.